On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, I am joined by the physical therapy students of McMaster University in Canada to talk about some of my best tips and career advice for starting your physical therapy career off in the right direction. The Ask Mike Reinald Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Hey guys, so like I mentioned in the email, we are so lucky to have Mike Reynold with us today to share his extensive experience in the sports medicine and sports performance world. Um, he has extensive background, but I made kind of a brief intro to kind of get you guys caught up on the experience he's going to bring us today. Um, so Mike Reynold is a physical therapist, an athletic therapist, and a certified strength and conditioning specialist. He's worked with a vast number of athletes from many different sports backgrounds with an emphasis on throwing injuries within the baseball community. He worked for many years as the head athletic trainer and physical therapist for the Boston Red Sox. And prior to that, he was the coordinator of rehabilitative research and clinical education at the American Sports Medicine Institute under the direction of the legendary orthopedic surgeon, James, Dr. James Andrews, who you all should know as well. He is the co-founder and president of Champion Physical Therapy and Performance, which is a physical therapy and performance facility outside of Boston. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Reinold has made significant contributions in the research world, publishing over 50 journal articles and book chapters, many of which I have shared with all of you. And finally, he has a fantastic educational website where he shares new research and clinical experience. He has fantastic courses and memberships. I know because I've taken them all. Um, and <laughs> his, his inner circle provides amazing access to articles that I find so clinically relevant. I often spend a Sunday morning diving into them. And finally, he has a great podcast, Ask Mike Reinold, um, with perfectly length episodes that um, sharing information that you can implement into practice immediately. So welcome, Mike. Dang, Diana, that was that may have been one of my better introductions of all time. That was impressive. Well, thank how, you. How, how much prep work. And I don't know about all you guys. I, I, you guys have been doing presentations together, right? You've been Zooming with your class and stuff? So. Yeah, so kind of how this group started is, is when the pandemic hit and the school, school kind of shut down, I did all my uh, studies at McMaster. So I did my kin and my physical therapy there. And then I worked there uh, for six years in their kind of within their varsity teams and in their uh, sports medicine center. Oh, so wow. I have strong ties to the school. So when it shut down, I kind of reached out to a few of the students and just asked if they would be interested in online mentoring sessions um, that we just, <clears throat> excuse me, do weekly. And I throw my husband on the table, table in the background and show them. <laughs> techniques so we just kind of wing it but it's kind of similar to your podcast they submit the questions and then I kind of pick two each week oh that's fantastic through. good job and you, you know the neat part about zoom right like I, so you're reading that introduction and maybe because yeah. it was about me but I wasn't listening to any of that right what I was doing I was checking out your organizational system on your wall behind you which I was like <laughs> I, I feel like we need a tour of this room I want to I know I wanna... I've, I've got the Norma text over there and I think that's yeah. fantastic <laughs> And then I'm like, uh, I, I, I'm, I see your putter over there. So like my putter's over there. My, you know, <laughs> it's like, like, I I know. like it's, it's all the virtual appointments I've been doing with patients. Now it's funny what they pick up on. Like I will be right. showing an exercise and they're like, is that a golf club? What kind right. of talk do you have? And I'm yeah. like, let's focus. <laughs> we we have um, we still at, at Champion. We still have a staff meeting. We've been closed. It's been almost three months now. We've been closed uh, essentially. They're, we're doing some PT, but we have a staff meeting every week. And one of our strength coaches always like sits on his couch and zooms. And every week he's got like you know in the background you have like the three like framed photos, but they're they like link like so it's all one photo but in three different frames yeah they're like slightly off every week like and different every week so we're always like checking out the background be like and it's like two inches apart up down so anyway oh, so gosh. we should we should probably get to work now so i'm easily distracted so okay. um 
Awesome. But thank you, everyone. And I, I, for those that weren't connected to the audio there, I do have a, a request. I mean, obviously, it's, it's optional because everything's weird with Zoom now. But I want to see some videos. I, li I like to kind of check out the gallery view and see who we're talking to. So if you haven't turned on your video and you're not in your pajamas, that, there we go. We got a couple. Or sunbathing. Sweet. Good job there, Melissa. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, right? It's just so like, um, I, I like to see what, what people are doing uh, and just get some reactions here. Because, you know, I, I don't I don't know maybe maybe you guys are always participating but as the speakers and the, the persons that doing this staring at yourself is terrible it's just not a yeah. fun experience so you know we'd, we'd like to see kind of reactions and you know people nodding their heads like Mackenzie and stuff like that so that's I, I like that and then calling people out I like that like if somebody <laughs> starts like dozing off or something but uh, but anyway so uh, but anyway thank you so much for having me and hopefully you know give back a little bit and you know hopefully figure out um, you know some good questions and answers for you guys I know this is a challenging time for students and you know new grads that are struggling to find jobs and stuff so hopefully hopefully we can chat a little bit so thanks for having me awesome um, so I have three questions to start um, that kind of the group has asked me um, throughout our time and I thought I'd get your opinion on it um, and then uh, Brianna has some questions and then we can um, kind of open it up to you guys using the raise your hand button um, okay, so the first question, and I think the first session I did with the group, we, uh, I had talked about saying yes to opportunities that came my way professionally. And so often now we hear, you know, you got to get better at saying no and protect your time and, and, you know, always say no. But I mean, so much of my sport experience and my experience with teams was in exchange for a, like a free meal and a t-shirt. So looking back in your experience, do you kind of think of one opportunity that you said yes to that kind of changed the trajectory of your career? Wow, that, that's a that was a, that's a deep question too. That was actually a well written, a well written question. That was really good. Um, yeah, you know, it's actually funny. We usually think about this from the flip side, right? Where we say, um, you know, we should say no more often, right? So, um, one of the one of the probably most impactful books that I read in the last few years on that kind of topic was uh, "Ego Is the Enemy." Um, and it's not like, you know, like ego is not necessarily like a bad thing. Everybody thinks like the word ego means like bad, like egotistical in a negative sense like that. But it's about just like why we do things. Right. And, and one of the big things I got from that is that we probably should say no more because oftentimes you're saying yes for like ego. So you could argue right now, I should have said no to you when you were like, Hey Mike, can I, can you talk to my students for a half hour? Right. Yeah. And I don't know why I said yes. I just always say yes to things like this, but it's, it's, it's easy to, to kind of give back and, and do little things like this. So we're all kind of home. We all have some spare time. So this is the type of thing that, that is helpful to do. So, um, but you know, you're supposed to say no more often, I think is the key to life. But so in terms of saying, Yes. I mean, that's, I don't know, that's, that's kind of interesting, I guess. You know, it's amazing as you go through your careers and you guys get a little bit more advanced how things layer on top of one another and a decision you make turns into, you know, a sequence of events, right? So, you know, I, I actually, I sought out to work in baseball as a physical therapist because that was kind of my passion at the time. And I know, you know Brianna has some questions about passion and stuff, but you know, like I wanted to do that. Right. And I got lucky. I got, I got my dream job. I got my dream job in my twenties, which is crazy. Right. It's sad that now it's not my dream job anymore, but you know, like you, you never want to lose that dream. Right. But like, like I got my dream job in the twenties and I think you could argue there. I remember specifically what happened. I just, it, it's again, a sequence of events, but I put myself in a position where the Red Sox were looking for somebody like me. Right. So I remember I was speaking at the uh, APTA combined sections meeting and it was in Boston. I was currently in Birmingham, Alabama for working at ASMI. And I remember I agreed to speak at CSM. Right. So uh, as you guys learn, you guys all know APTA, you're all in Canada. Right. But, you know, APTA still cool to you guys. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but so. So the APTA CSM is like a big meeting. There's like 10,000 people at some of these meetings. Right. But it's funny, like they don't like they don't reimburse you for anything. You still have to like pay. So, you know, when, when we go to I'm, and I'm not complaining here, but like literally when, when I go to APTA CSM, they like put me to work. I'm doing like, you know, two talks a day. I'm jumping all around and I have to completely pay all that out of your pocket. So sometimes you, you start to get annoyed at that process. But I said yes, because I was like, all right, you know, it's a good opportunity. It was a free trip home, let's be honest, going back to Boston. But um, uh, it was um, uh, a weird opportunity, but I gave a presentation and in 
the audience was somebody that was affiliated with Mass General Hospital and they just started working with the Red Sox and they grabbed me afterwards and they say, hey, we want to talk to you. So if I didn't do that and I didn't say yes to that opportunity, I think I, I, I may not have, you know, had the sequence of events that happened. So um, I, what, to give you a good like, like lesson from all this here, I think is that is it's okay if you don't know your master plan and your dream job right now, you're not supposed to know that. Right. Um, it, you know, it's okay if you don't, but you try to have as much of a plan in place as you can. And when you have a decision come in front of you, should I do this or not? You just think, well, this helped me get to my end game goal. Right. So I think that's an important concept right there. And, and you, you know, that's how you can kind of make some decisions. And that's what I kind of learned from that book. Ego is the enemy. So um, as you can, you can tell Diane, I'm a terrible question answer right yeah, kind no, of that was off great. On, uh, ta and tangents but a little bit but hopefully that helped no that was great <laughs> um okay next question so depending on the specialty of physiotherapy you want to work in there can be lots of gaps in knowledge within the educational program um and overall i think exercise rehabilitation is very poorly done in our program um and uh and even just surrounding building programs and and kind of you know, even exercises to, to give and prescription and, and that type of thing. So it's something that's not discussed. What do you think is important to know about programming and kind of periodization of programming um, when you're building a rehabilitation program for someone? And do you think this is where your CSCS kind of filled that knowledge gap for you? Yeah, good, good question. I, I, I feel like our, our brains, like as individuals, have uh, surpassed what like is in a PT curriculum nowadays, right? If you, if you flash back like 20, 30 years ago and you said, what's physical therapy? I think it's most people think of it as like the, the acute and subacute type things and everything in our world's based off insurance and stuff like that. So like most people get discharged before they get to advanced phases. So it was like our profession just like didn't really care about that end right it's like once you get your range of motion back once you can take a bath right once you can <laughs> you know you know you can you can walk your discharge you're out and the physical therapy is over right and i think that was probably physical therapy like maybe in the 70s the 80s something like that you know back in the day as our professions evolved but now as we're working with more active people especially when you, you know, like talk about like even athletes trying to get back to sport or something like that they're nowhere near ready for sport by the time they meet discharge criteria all the time so i feel like our our curriculums and our our college educations are aren't really there to get us to that level and you probably do need to seek some outside education to get yourself better at that right and uh, trust me so uh, yeah i'm in a couple of different like societies of other physical therapists and we meet every year and we kind of talk about things like one of our our, our big meetings that we do every year is probably about 40 of us in this group is called icus uh icus was the first athletic trainer in the greek like Olympic games, I guess, or whatever. But anyway, so we, um, you know, we meet every year and we kind of talk about things and, and like Tim Hewitt, big ACL research is, is in this group and stuff. And, and, and we talk about different trends in our, in our, our field. And the big one right now is like, like return to sport after like, let's say ACLs. Right. And everybody looks like crap at six months and we're still letting them go back to sports. And then we're wondering why we're getting some of these failures. Right. So when we ask our group and we look around and be like, Hey, are you, are your guys weak? Do you do, does your quad weak and your athletes, uh, you know, like after surgery, everyone in that room says no. Right. So, but if you look at the, the systematic review that's published, that looks at thing, everybody looks like poor quality. So I think what happens is certain groups of people that work with athletes have gone above and beyond their basic curriculum to learn advanced strength and conditioning and periodization schemes. So to answer your, you know, to make a long story longer, right? Like it's, it's, you have to seek that outside right now because I don't think our PT curriculums are getting us past like the three sets of 10 phase, right. And talking about advanced periodization. So I would say, your, your first step in this education process is probably like a CSCS through the NSCA, which is just becoming like a certified strength and conditioning coach. But trust me, that in no way is going to really make you that good 
of a coach. You can't call yourself a coach or be a coach with that because you have to experience it. You have to actually train people and work with people. So if you find yourself in a generic outpatient setting where you only work with people for like six weeks after surgery, just realistically, you're probably never going to get good at that because you don't get to practice it every day. So if you're not in that environment, then what you need to do is you need to get some friends that are in that environment. So maybe, you know, like some personal trainers down the street or strength coaches at a gym nearby and you collaborate back and forth and you try to work with them a little bit. But CSCS is like your book smart version of that, but then you still need like a practical application. So ironically, we have a strength and conditioning internship at our place at Champion, which is mostly for strength coaches. And I can't tell you how many PT students or new grads we actually get that come and work with us for like three, four months, depending on the season as a strength coach. They don't even, they're not doing PT with us. They're doing it as a strength coach. And I think that makes you a more powerful physical therapist as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, last question. Um, so one theme we've kind of discussed every week with this group is the importance of watching people move. And, you know, irregardless of the injury they came in with, just kind of watching how they move and looking for compensation strategies within this movement. Um, and I've told the group, you know, the shift in my own practice when I first graduated, you know, if you came in with a shoulder injury, you, I treated the shoulder and then, you know, injury over and, and they left. And I was getting referrals from a strength and conditioning coach for asymptomatic um, athletes. And I was like, you don't have any pain. You're fine. Like, get out of here. I got, I'm too busy with people who have pain. So I've talked about kind of in, in part in taking your course as well, but the shift in my thought, thought and treatment over the last 10 years. So in, pra in your own practice, um, are you seeing a lot more like asymptomatic people seek out treatment? And do you think this is what's going to kind of be what we see going forward in private practice? I mean, I hope so. I mean, that's what, that's what we're doing. I would say, I don't even know the percentage, but maybe like half of, half of probably the clients that we see are probably what you would deem like healthy. Right. You know, so we, we'd like to call them suboptimal, but that means they're not in pain. They're not injured. They're not post-operative, but they want to get better at something. Right. Maybe they want to improve their mobility or their strength or whatever it may be, um, especially in the athletic world. Right. So, you know, I work with a lot of baseball players. Obviously, every time you pitch, you kind of hurt yourself. Right. So it's like you have a micro injury every time you pitch because, you know, that's just the nature of the sport. So, um, you know, our jobs to like mini rehab you back because you get a throw again in five days, you know, so that that sort of thing. But I, I think it's it's the future. So we kind of talk about this in the spectrum of our healthcare models and, you know, wherever that, you know, different states different countries have different you know you know uh probably scopes of what they have here but oftentimes the therapy if, th if this is the baseline i can never tell in zoom which is left and right if this is a mirror or not a mirror so i don't know but let's say this is baseline in the middle and let's say this is the bad way right so you have somebody injured right our job in physical therapy is to restore them to their baseline well what if their baseline's crappy right mm -hmm. and then great we just restore them back to their crappy selves right and they're probably going to get back to where they were before so we got to go past baseline right so did that work left or right or is i backwards i don't know no, if that that was good. Right. <laughs> so uh, but like so our goal is to get people better than baseline because oftentimes their baseline is poor and that's why they're probably having symptoms over time so that's when we start talking about like performance-based stuff and optimizing things is we want to make sure that we're not just like getting people out of pain but we're optimizing them so we teach our students this a champion. It's, it's, it's a couple of things. When somebody comes in with like an injury for an evaluation, we're going to do two things. And this is how I talk to the client too. And I say, we're going to do two things. First thing, I'm going to look to see, you know, what's broke, right? And then I'm going to say, what's suboptimal, right? And you're coming in with shoulder pain. So the first thing I want to do is, okay, is there anything structurally wrong with you, right? Is there a pathology I want to find? So we're going to do a specific evaluation for that. But then I'm also going to look to see what's suboptimal. Many times people come in with shoulder pain and I'm like, hey, good news, your shoulder looks fine, right? And I've calmed down, you're going to be okay. Like there's nothing structurally wrong with it. You're just like a little, you know, overwhelmed. But boom, I've got these four things that are uh, suboptimal on our checklist and we're going to start working on those. And then we'll kind of see what happens to your pain as that gets a little bit better. So I think that's the future. Now, Blue Cross Blue Shield and insurance yeah. companies disagree with me, but like they, uh, I, I also think like the part of the future of our professions is probably going to be more towards cash based models as well. And not necessarily exclusively cash based, but just realizing that like, look, there some things are covered by insurance and some things aren't. 
right? When you go get your car worked on, right? Like if you have a major issue with your car, it's probably under warranty, it's covered, you're fine, right? But, you know, stuff like an oil change isn't covered, right? Rotating your tires isn't covered, like stuff like that. So I, I, I think we have to get out of that, that mode where people think physical therapy or physiotherapy is just when you're broke or, or injured or post-surgical, and that's the only time you can go see a, a physio. Um, so that's going to take a while, right? That's going to take years of reform for us to get that across. But I think you can make that difference in your community when you settle down and you guys graduate and you get jobs because you can start to just get the word out there. But you have to, like, seriously, guys, you have to live and breathe that, right? That has to be your motto. That has to be, like, your byline for, like, your business when you're in there. And that's kind of what we do at Champion. Like, we help optimize people. That's kind of what we say. Like we're trying to help optimize people. And then you become known for that. And trust me, everybody goes through physio and they all think it stinks, right? You go four weeks, straight leg raises, you work with the therapist for five to 10 minutes and then you beat it, right? We see that all the time. So it's very underwhelming. They come to you and all of a sudden you're looking at them more globally than you're working on this, you're working on that. Boom, they tell everyone right? Especially if you're in like sports or something like that, like a golfer, like, you know, comes to us and their shoulder hurts. And then all of a sudden we increase their rotation and then they can hit the ball further. They're telling all their friends, right? <laughs> and, they're, and that's how like the snowball kind of like happens over time. So you have to like breathe that a little bit. So. Awesome. Go ahead, Brianna. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You actually touched on um, a couple of my questions. So that was perfect. We're kind of on the same page there. But um, one question I really wanted to ask, and I've asked other people it as well, because I really like getting their input. But um, the question that I, the way I worded it was, would you encourage a new grad to specialize in their area of passion right at a school? Or do you think it's more beneficial to get exposure to generalized, say, ortho for maybe a few years first to kind of get that foundation? And like, just to add a bit of a personal touch on it, for me, I feel like I'm starting to really find like my niche. And I and I'm excited by it, but I have that anxiety of jumping right into it out of school just because I've loved all my clinical placements. I've loved being in ortho, sports, the hospital. So I don't know. I'm not sure if I want to take that leap right away, you know? Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, I agree. And if anybody else is named uh, Rhymes, like if we have a Susanna or a Joanna or anything, they just be, you just let's all jump in and ask questions. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I, my opinion on that question has changed over the years. So when I first got started, um, especially when I started like my website, I started my website like well over 10 years now. It's kind of, yeah, and I'll be honest with you, I got lucky, right? Like Diana gave me some like, you know, good praise, right, with her introduction. But I got lucky. I was kind of just like first to market with like being a prolific PT online with like social media and a blog and stuff like that. So I, I kind of got lucky. But when I first started that, I definitely got criticism from people. They're just like, well, that, that guy's not a good physical therapist. And I, I'm like, All right, what do you mean? It's like, well, like, you're not good at like spine. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm terrible at spine. And they're like, well, you're not good at geriatrics. I'm like, yeah, no, I I, yeah, I hate old people. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Like, I'm like, I don't, yeah, like, no, I'm not. So somebody would say, somebody would actually call me a bad physical therapist. Right. So, and, and it's kind of funny. And as, as I got like, I, like I grasped that concept and I said, like, like, I don't want to be generic at everything. I want to be like really good at a couple of things. Right. And if you even just look at my website, right. I don't teach things that I don't feel like I'm really good at right? Like there's no articles on my website about foot and ankle, right? I, you know, feet stink, right? It's not a big passion of mine, right? So I, I don't, you know, you're not going to find some articles about foot and ankle because that's not me, right? It's, it's shoulder knee performance basically, right? And that's, that's kind of what I do, right? And, and, and I think you should do that. That being said, Brianna though, if you do have to learn some of the basics, right? So what I often tell people to do, you guys are, are probably too new at this. This is too big of a topic for you, like too big of a, a scope. But maybe when you get three, four or five years into your practice, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a step back. I want you to do an audit of yourself, right? And you want to do your audit of your skills and your knowledge base and then figure out where you want to go from there. Okay. And I think that's really important. So the first thing you can do is you can look at like joint specific stuff and you say, let me go through all the joints. What am I comfortable with? What am I not comfortable with? Right. And then figure out if you even care. Right. So for me, like I, you know, I actually, you know, same, same thing with me. I, about 10 years ago, I thought to myself, I'm not good enough at spine. I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with spine. So I went to every freaking course I could go to on spine. Right. And you know what I found out? 
I was probably pretty good at spine at the, you know, I just, there's nobody's good at spine, right? But no, it's, uh, it's just not, it, there's no magic that you're like, wow, I mean, am I missing something? It's, it's not that it's more of a confidence thing, but go through each of the joints and say, what do I need to get better at? But if you're in a practice where you never, ever, ever treat a spine, then you don't have to focus on that, right? That's your, your mode you're in. So that's number one. Then two is you go activities. Maybe that's sport. Maybe that's like, I want to work with football, soccer, or, you know, baseball, whatever it be, that activity. I think you can kind of do that. And then the third audit is like, is like skill. So it's like, hey, I want to get better with manipulations. I want to get better with soft tissue work. I want to get better with exercise prescription, right? So I want you to do a self audit at some point in time and say, what's your comfort level with joints, activities, and skills? And that's where you can find out where you want to go with your continuous your education but make it specific to the population in front of you right so to answer your question about passion and kind of getting back with that here i think you have to you have to get to a point where you feel comfortable with your basic skill sets and if you're there and you're comfortable and you want to stick to your your passion then i would definitely say do that i do not think we're going to do any of ourselves or our profession profession justice if we be can continue to be generic physios and we can do a little bit of everything i want you guys to be awesome at something or some things and roll with it right and just and that and that's fine like your coworker deal with all the spines or that you know your weird pt friend that likes feet let him work with that right you don't want to deal with that right so like we, we you think of it that way i think that's how you kind of want to want to get there so you may not be ready day one because it's overwhelming that like you have you know very little self-confidence probably that you're going to be able to get people better but once you start getting there i definitely think we should niche out and we should be a little bit more passionate about where we go otherwise like life gets really boring to be honest with you thank you that was that was a really good answer um i have more questions but i know will has a really good question that i think he should ask gonna nice <laughs> But nice no spot. I like it. <laughs> What's up, Will? This better be good or you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, well, I have a couple questions. I don't know which one Brianne is talking about, but I'll ask one. Uh, one thing that I find a little bit tricky just on clinical placements is patients are often looking for a specific diagnosis and sometimes can't really pinpoint what that might be. It's kind of more of a generic kind of issue. And I was just wondering if you could touch on the role of patient education when there is not really that x-ray that says this is the cause or anything like that really yeah no good question will you're actually you're going to find that probably more often than you think it's really i don't want to say it's rare because that's not fair but it's not not every day you're going to say like oh boom it's your meniscus your meniscus is the cause of all your troubles right because especially too if you do let's say you come in and you diagnose it is a meniscus well what do you do you're going to do the same thing you're going to do anyway, even if you didn't have that meniscus diagnosis, right? It's the same kind of concept. So what I always tell people, again, it goes back to what I kind of was answering that other one. You do two things. What's broke? What's suboptimal? And you educate them with that. You say, okay, let's look pathological. Be like, you know what? All right, let's say a shoulder pain person like that. You know what? Looks like your cuff's like a little inflamed, but it doesn't look like you have a rotator cuff tear. It doesn't look like blah, 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 right? All those things. So it looks like you just maybe just overloaded your workload, increased too much. You're suboptimal in these areas. Let's just focus on that. You don't have to give them a diagnosis, right? Now, if somebody does have a diagnosis and when you go to that what's broke, what's optimal, and you do have a what's broke, like, ooh, your anterior capsule looks torn, right? You had a dislocation episode, then that's different. You can have that. But I would say the vast majority of non-operative people are going to be non-specific pain right so your goal is to get them just again that suboptimal checklist more more than anything else and you just have to educate them with that and but trust me from my experience like they may come in wanting a diagnosis but you're going to give them a plan not a diagnosis you know what i mean you're going to give them a oh crap that was awesome will just said you know my shoulders hurt but it's because of a b and c and d and we're going to work on all four of those things and they're going to be ecstatic awesome thank you what did you think, Brianna? Was that the was that the one? Yeah, well, she just good. texted me, and it wasn't really the one she was asking. Dang it! Yeah, what, what, yeah, what's your other one? Well, let's okay. Go. So, just as soon to be new grads, um, a lot of job off like descriptions or whatever say two, three years experience, ex so forth. How do you kind of navigate going about that? Uh, obviously, we don't have experience applying for jobs. So, what kind of I don't know? How could we sell ourselves to those types of job offers? 
I think you're giving the employers too much credit. They're all probably like Googling like a physical therapy job description template and just throwing it on a, a website. Um, I, I, I think you're, you're giving them too much credit. Uh, I think everybody knows, right, as a new grad, there's going to be some work with you, right? There's going to have to be some mentoring. There's going to have to be some con ed that you get through. Um, most physical therapy clinics I know of um, tend to embrace that, right? Um, probably more just because you're cheaper labor, but they, uh, they know it's an investment in you down over time. So I would say don't be intimidated by that. I think what you can kind of... Um, what you can kind of, you know, do for yourself is talk a little bit more about what you've done yourself to make yourself better than the other new grads. Does that make sense? You can say like, Hey, I'm, especially if you're finding a job that like is in a realm that you're really passionate about, like a clinic that works with like, let's say like a lot of high school athletes. And you're like, you know, this is, I love that. I just went to this seminar. I've, I've learned from these three people online, right? That's how you set yourself apart with that. So um, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, that little clause in the job description well nice answer thanks <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right I'm, I'm done I'm done <laughs> that's awesome well I, I, we kind of said it before but if you have a question I, I think you can raise your hand right I'm always the I'm always the host so I don't know like is there like a button to raise your hand but like raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you can ask a question um, love to uh, to get some more um, and if nobody has any maybe uh, I know Brianna may have another one or two upper sleeve. No, oh, you guys are quiet. This is, your, this, is your, this is your time to shine, right? Usually what happens, somebody will nervously jump in and be like, Mike, what, what, what do you think about the shoulder? <laughs> you're like, you're like, that, that, that. like, you didn't prepare well for this meeting, did you? <laughs> like, too broad, too broad. <laughs> I have one. Um, yeah. So when you started and Diana already went through kind of your long list of accolades, how did you really work to prioritize and balance trying to do everything and achieve your goals? Uh, to be honest with you, I, my goal was always like to work in baseball at the beginning. So I, I, that was like my primary focus. And I was, I, I was trying to put myself in a position to, to do that. So the first thing I did was, um, how many of you guys have heard of the American Sports Medicine Institute? So I see a couple of nods in there, right? So yeah, th this was like in the early 90s, right? This is before the internet, right? So I'm older than I look. I'm just really short. So I look youthful. But um, I, I, it's, uh, it's at the time, they were the leaders in baseball sports medicine. So I said, I got to figure out how to get you know, I, I, how do I get in with that group? So at the time, you literally just called people on like a landline, right? So I called up Dr. Glenn Fleissig. He's the research coordinator. He's got probably the number one uh, expert in baseball pitching biomechanics, right? And I just called him up, right? And I didn't know what to expect. Called him up and he's just like, hey, smile, this is Glenn. And I'm like, uh, you know, I was like, whoa, I didn't think you were going to pick up. Like, like, I wasn't prepared for that. And I was just like, you know, hey, you know, you know, I'm a physical therapy student up in Boston. You know, I really admire you guys. Like, I just put myself out there. So he's like, come on down. You can do a research project with us. You can do like an internship with us. Great. And then yada, 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 that kind of like escalated. Like, I remember I did that and they're like, hey, when you graduate school, do you want to, do you want to? you know, move down to, to Alabama and work here. And I'm like, hell no, right? I don't want to live in Alabama, right? Like that's a big difference from, uh, from Boston, right? So I said no, but then they're like, well, how about a fellowship with, with Kevin Welk and Dr. Andrews? I'm like, okay, all right, that's, that's pretty good. I'll do it for one year. And then again, yada, yada, yada. And I'm there almost 10 years, like as, as it was just a good experience over time. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, for me, I sought out the I sought out the people I, that I wanted to learn from and, and who I wanted to be a part with. And I kind of, I kind of like put that together. So uh, another, I'm getting off topic here again, follow me. Here's a good, another funny story you guys can make fun of me about, but um, I did the same thing with the doctor of the Red Sox, the Boston Red Sox. Cause again, I'm just an idiot student, right? Um, like you guys, right? Uh, and I, I was, I literally like did the same thing. I like called up, this is the nineties, right? And he, answered the phone right it was crazy it's like why is this guy answering the phone and and he was so like like taken back that i just called out of the blue to try to say like hey i'd love to like learn from you meet from you he's like tell you what i want to bring you to a red sox game friday night come with me come sit in my seats and we'll talk here's the mistake i made right this was like later in my college career right 
I already had tickets to that game with all my friends and it was going to be a party. Right. So we, uh, so I actually said, Oh, you know, I made up an excuse where I couldn't do it because I wanted to go to the game with my friends. And then I like called them back next week, never answered the phone ever again. So I lost that opportunity. So total like side thing right there, but you know, it's like, you know, try to grasp your opportunity, but like, you know, pick opportunity over your friends maybe <laughs> i don't know the life lesson from that but hopefully you can learn from my mistake there <laughs> all right i promise i'll, I'll have more uh, um, uh specific answers going forward and not be so vague but uh who else anybody else want to raise their hand I, can, I don't know if i can see anybody with raised hands i don't know if you want but oh we've got is that benjamin's got a thumb up we'll do that here i'll unmute you there i think i'm unmuting you Awesome. What's up, okay. Benjamin? Not much. Um, so I, I, a lot of people talk about walking uh, and kind of gait analysis as a really good uh, way to kind of functionally assess. And obviously that's something that takes a lot of practice. Um, and you focus a little bit more on kind of the upper extremity. What's a good functional test that you like to use to try and obviously with your expertise to try and see kind of what might be going on? Uh, with around the shoulder or, or kind of upper upper spine uh, if someone kind of comes to you with non-specific pain or even uh, to try and find how to optimize them yeah I would say like in, in my background when I was like probably where you guys were I got really into biomechanical stuff especially with my interaction with the ASMI and stuff like that so I'm a big fan of biomechanics and how that works but the more I learned the more I realized that there are so many variations in the way people do things that it's really hard to say like oh you're walking wrong or you're walking you're not walking right or whatever it may be right so look at like like I don't, I'm trying to think of like obvious examples in sports but like a baseball pitcher even like a golf swing right there's so many different ways people do that and they're all successful so it's super hard to say like what's the best way to do things right I've seen a lot of new grads like also like like go through this assessment somebody's like three weeks out of acl reconstruction they try to do a gait assessment they're like yeah you're limping and the person's like yeah no crap i'm limping i just had acl surgery three weeks ago i know i'm limping that is like that's not why i came to see you right so uh I, so i look at those things but what i started to do benjamin i started to do it a little bit different i started to say what do I want to look at in terms of a mechanical assessment or a movement assessment that will directly impact the way I treat somebody, right? So not just look at somebody to look at somebody, but what will I do? So we took a big step back and we reverse hacked that thought process. And we said, okay, when we write somebody a program, let's say a comprehensive program. So this is kind of blending into performance therapy now too, and performance training. We say, what do we do for exercises? And we categorize things by movements, right? We don't train muscles, we train movements. So we broke it down. We have a hinge, a squat, a forward lunge, a lateral lunge, a step, multi-segmental rotation, overhead reach, push and pull, right? That's how we program, right? So if that's how we're going to program and that's how I'm going to write your program, I want to assess how well you move in each of those categories, right? So we came up with just like our own little movement screen and we kind of, we, we did that in our champion performance specialist program that we put together, but it's, this is how we look at those movement patterns. And then if it doesn't go well, this is exactly how I program right and this isn't a negative of some of the other systems like fms and stuff like that but th those are those do a good job at looking at movement but th i don't think they do as good of a job at telling you what to do if somebody's not moving well so we try to come up with an exact system we say all right if you can't hinge we're going to do this manual therapy these corrective drills yada 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 here's how we're going to load you that type of thing so i i would say take a giant step back and there's two things gross movements like we just outlined and then when you get past that you can get specific i don't know if i'd go gate necessarily but maybe like running mechanics throwing mechanics hitting mechanics like sport specific mechanics like that's like upper level stuff Does that makes sense so yeah, I, I i i mean hopefully that wasn't too vague but i would say is like take a big step back first and before you start nitpicking how somebody walks for example why don't you nitpick how they move first and then see if any of that right. correlates to their out. So walking to me is the outcome, right? You have to look at their capacity to be able to walk before you even get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank and you. I, 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 and then remember you see somebody walking weird and you're going to be like, yeah, definitely not walking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then have no idea what to do. Right. So you still, you have to like figure out what you need to do. So mm -hmm. awesome. Good question. Nice. Let me see. Oh, I see Brent. Oh, so we got some thumbs up. Let's go. Is that Mara? Did I say that well, Mara? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> what's, up, what's up, Mara? 
Uh, so my question is, are there any major mistakes in programming that either new grads or PTs make that we should avoid? That's a good question. I'd say that one of the biggest mistakes I see new grads make is we, t we tend to underload. I think that's our bigger thing. Not that you want to go crazy and, you know, break people down, but like, I think we tend to underload and not emphasize strength development enough. Right. And that's, again, kind of going back to what, um, you know, we talked about earlier with some of the questions, it's like understanding different loading schemes and periodization schemes to try to get more strength out of people. But you can't just do three sets of 10 forever. Um, I think that's the biggest programming mistake we tend to see is we just don't get advanced enough. You know, we've had athletes come to us from other facilities that are three months after ACL and they're still doing straight leg raises, you know? So, I mean, I'm sure their hip flexor is ridiculously strong now, but like there's, there's, there's more to life than straight leg raises. Great. That, sounds, that, so, that sounds like a tweet. Should we tweet that? There's more to life than straight leg raises. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> like a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can do that. All right, who else? Anybody else? Maybe we'll take a couple more. You guys get anything more exciting you want to talk about? I have a question. I just sent you yeah. a message. I hope that's okay. Uh, that's aggressive. Um, I like it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, if you were interviewing someone for a job, what's one thing that they could say in the interview that would make you want to hire them on the spot versus one thing that they would say and you would send them out the door? Oof, trust me, there's a lot you can say that I would send you out the door for. But um, well, when we when we see students, we're looking. We, I, I predominantly look at like one category. It's their uh, like their growth mindset, and you know that's a buzzword now, right? Like everybody, you know, that's up there with uh, change the narrative. I'm trying to think all the other cool things I see on Instagram, right? But like um, at this growth mindset concept here is. Um, Believe it or not, I've seen a lot of students that have come in with opinions, right? And that blows my mind, right? So, like, for example, like, we're a champion, right? Like, I do ultrasound sometimes. How many of you people, like, think ultrasound is, like, awful, right? So, right? And most of you are preconceived to think ultrasound is awful because, like, 20 years ago, Blue Cross said it was awful. So, now everybody says it's awful, right, because they don't reimburse for it. But there's studies that show that if you, you can tweak the settings and you can do an ultrasound on a ligament and it may promote healing, right? So if I have a baseball player, he has a partial Tommy John's brain, we're trying to get him back. I want to throw the freaking kitchen sink at him, right? Why wouldn't I do an ultrasound on this ligament if I can show in a rat that their MCLs healed faster if I did a pulse ultrasound on their ligament, right? So we have a justification for why we do it, right? And we're a little bit different because we don't really care about the insurance model, but like I, we'll have a student come in and just be like, I can't believe you're ultrasounding them. That's, you can't do that. That's stupid. And we're like, all right, you're fired. Right. But no, it's, it's, it, they come in with like preconceived opinions that, that they have because social media right now is super influential. Right. And you guys are, a lot of you guys are learning from social media, which blows my mind. Right. It's just not a good place to learn. Right. It's more like edutainment than education, but um, they come in with those, those preconceived things. So if you come to me with a growth mindset and say, look, in the last six months, there, here's the two, three things I've done to grow, right? And I can't wait to grow more. I, I, I want to learn how you guys do things. I want to be mentored by your staff. I want to, I, you know, I can't wait to grow. But with confidence, not like, ooh, I'm afraid, I'm scared, I, I don't have self-confidence in myself, I need to learn more. It's like, a no, I can't, I, I'm excited to learn. I want this, I want to grow. All right? that, that's the key to me. If you come in with a fixed mindset where you actually think with your one, two, three years experience that the last 80 years of our profession was all wrong, right, that's not going to fly. That's not going to go very well. So be careful with that mindset when you go in there. Um, and I, I find too, if you have too strong of a Opinion too earlier in your career, you tend to try to justify that opinion in your future thoughts rather than having an open mind about whether or not you're right or not because you don't want to be proven wrong. So keep that in mind. So, so to answer your question, growth mindset I think is the way to do it. But like an excited growth mindset, you know, if if, if you look at our staff at Champion, you look at our people here, I I think we're all studs, right? Like everybody there is an exceptional person at their job because they choose to none of nobody's a nine to five or nobody's like you know just trying to get in and out they want to be the best they can right you guys know dave tilly shift movement science.com he's the one of our pts a big gymnastics guy you should see the crap this guy's reading it's insane he's like like, like chemical reactions and brains it's like during his lunch break right it's insane we all just like laugh at him but he's like such a he's just such a learner that he wants to do that uh at all times and that is what we're looking for in our young hires. Thank you. That was a really good answer. <laughs>
you guys are gonna think, wow, this guy is really not professional. <laughs> I'm too no, casual. They, they've heard me every Friday, so they they know. I, 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 I'm, I, for me, it's about it's trying to help. It's trying to help, right? And this is like the reality of what's what's real out there. And even like the little things you learn in school like special tests and stuff you learn in school, like half of them don't work the way that you think they do because it's not all textbook based. So you got to like, you got to get some experience with those things. You have to like keep like a growth mindset. It'd be, it'd be pretty important. So, all right. How about one more? What do you got? Who's going to, who's going to be the finale? Better be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to, we're going to end on a good strong one. What do you guys think? I think we should randomly pick somebody that has their video off and just unmute them and see what what noises we hear. That could be good, but what do you think? Diane, I'll let you pick someone. Okay. <laughs> oh, gosh. oh boy, everyone's flipping their videos. I know, everyone's like, right, gotta go. Numbers. Leave, leave meeting, leave meeting. Does anyone else have a question? <laughs> Rana, do you have a question that you didn't ask? I think Daniel raised his hand or his thumb. Oh, you know what's see funny? What I didn't see it. So Julian unmuted himself. Julian, do you have a question? Because you would have been the person I would have picked to unmute. <laughs> Man, I have my camera on. I, I can't see you, but I, I was just going to scroll through the list and find you and unmute you. <laughs> I'm in a new house today, by the way. I like, it. I like, I like the background. <laughs> he, has, he has a new house every week that he's in. That's funny. I think Daniel did have a question though. I saw him raise his thumb, so while well, he's saying his question. I don't see it, Daniel. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you. Oh, yeah. I oh, okay, you. I got you. What's you up, me? Daniel? Yeah, I can see hey, you. Uh, so what I was wondering, uh, so you have you have obviously strength and conditioning experience and you're coming in or, or working as a PT uh, with the CSCS, which not necessarily everybody will have. And so what I'm wondering is if if you can speak to working in a team environment with, uh, like, let's say the strength coach for the Red Sox or, or whoever it is, is prescribing programs to athletes and there seems to be a discrepancy or, or based on your experience and your knowledge, uh, you feel there might be a conflict uh, with what they're being given to do day in, day out in their training uh, versus what their rehab uh, might entail and how you might go about uh, dealing with those conflicts and if they even arise or if uh, at that level strengths coaches just kind of know what they're talking about and uh, you take it <laughs> as it is. <laughs> well, you, you would hope they do, right? And I think that's, I think that's the key because when you build a team, you have to build a team of like-minded people that all bring a different skill set to the table, right? So hopefully you've built the right team and it's, it's you know, you're, you're close. But collaboration is the key. And that's part of, you know, some of our core fundamentals at Champion that we built here is that we wanted to have a bunch of multidisciplinary skill sets working together. And that's why we have a gym. That's why we have PT and we kind of integrate the two together. Um, uh, could I write somebody's training program? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've done it plenty of times, right? But I'd rather hire a coach that's like really good at programming to be that person. But the key comes down to this is collaboration. And this is sometimes where young physical therapists, physios kind of get into trouble a little bit, especially with like sport coaches versus strength coaches, start to step on toes. And all of a sudden you think like you're like a golf mechanical expert, right? And you're trying to tweak somebody's grip or swing or something like that right so um, oftentimes it's it's about stepping on toes a little bit so the way we do it is pretty simple like a champion it's pretty simple like if I have if I have somebody that's working with me exclusively and they want to start getting into the gym I don't go out there and say hey do a B and C right because I'm telling them how to do their job what I go out there and I say is hey I want you to focus on this and I want you to avoid this, right? I don't tell them how to get their job done. I just say, I want you to focus on, hey, let's get some good glute development. We need some posterior chain strength or something like that. And then let them run with it. And if you have, if the team's set up well and you have the right people in place, then that is going to work itself out. What's going to, what you're going to get in trouble as a young clinician is you come in there and you start overstepping a little bit and you start telling them exactly what to do. That's going to really like, you know, stuff be too stuffy for them and it's not going to really go well especially like in a in a in a collaborative team environment like collegiate or pro sports or something like that you know so just you know surround yourself with 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 good people and i think that that helps awesome thank you yeah good question i like it so tell you what i want i want to leave you guys with this one thing 
right? Because this is what I've been telling my students a lot here, and I've done this a little bit online, but I probably need to get a little bit more formal. I, I'm trying to put together like a free course for like students and new grads that kind of go over like even some of these questions we're talking about, because everybody has the same questions. But I want to leave you guys with this. This is the development process that I see and where you guys see in this phase, right? But as you progress through your careers, you go from everyone wants to be an expert right away, right? But you have to develop in this order. It starts with knowledge, then skill, right? Then experience, and then judgment. That's the big, big, big key right there. You can't, you're never going to be an expert at your craft, right? Even if it's just like a niche type thing or a diverse thing, you're never going to be, you know, specific to that. So let me explain. So knowledge, you've learned that in school. You got your book smarts. You have that. You have knowledge. You can always get smarter. Don't get me wrong, right? But you have knowledge, right? But you don't have a ton of skills yet right? I'm assuming you guys don't, right? Maybe you guys are starting, you're starting to get a little bit of school, skills in school and your clinicals, but it takes you a couple of years to get some skills out in the clinical setting too. So knowledge comes first, then skills, but you still have no experience, right? And then you're going to, in your head, you're going to be like, oh, okay. All right. Geez. Last time I saw something like this, it went like that. And you can start making some opinions a little bit stronger based on that. Right? So you need some experience. And then finally you have judgment right? Everybody wants to proclaim expertise on Instagram nowadays and seem like an expert, right? But you have to go through those four phases, right? Knowledge, skill, experience, and judgment. And that's how you become finely tuned with your craft and you start feeling good about yourself, right? So just remember what phase you're in right now. I would say the biggest phase you guys need right now is skills and reps. That's we say that all the time is just keep trying to find like what skill set do you think you're most deficient in? Do that little mini audit, right? And get better at that skill while you're getting reps. And then in three to five years, you're going to look back and you're going to be so confident in yourself because now you develop those things, you get a little bit of judgment and then you can start, uh, you can start like becoming a little bit more of a, of an expert in a small portion of our field. Right. And then that keeps just layering itself off. Okay. So just keep that in mind with that development, because I think then you can really focus on what you probably need most right now. And for now it's, it's, it's probably reps, right? So just get out there. Remember when everybody graduates, they all feel unsure of themselves, right? They're not truly confident in their skill sets, but you guys know way more than you think you just need experience. You need to like, okay, let me get this person out of shoulder pain. And then you're like, yeah, I did it. And then you'll know what to do next time. And then that, that'll get better and better every time. Make sense. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me and obviously for Diana and Brianna for, you know, being a part of the, the organization of this and all the great questions, all the great videos. I'm not bitter about half of you that never turned their cameras on, uh, but, uh, uh, but thanks so much for doing this and, and heck I'm easy to find online. So, you know, if you guys have questions down the road, just reach out and, and uh, good luck with, with uh, your upcoming careers once this pandemic ends. Right. Yes. Thank you so much, Mike, that this was invaluable to the group. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a good day. Social distance bump. <laughs> Let's do it.